Welcome to part two of Lands of Legend, in which I, author J.K. Knaus, narrate a tour for you of medieval Spain through the locations that appear in my novel Seven Noble Knights. In the last installment, we had just come to a disastrous end of the wedding of the two villains of the story, Ruy Blasquez and Don Yalambra. The Count of Castile has sent everyone home after the disaster, and part of the peacekeeping measures are that the seven brothers need to follow Don Yalambra back to her new holdings in a place called Barberillo, which is in their home region of Lara. This very photo was taken in a pueblo in the region of Lara called Los Aucines, and it's the first in a public art series telling the story of Seven Noble Knights. I stumbled upon this series while in Lara with my friend Danielle. I have a blog post all about that adventure in the cold in January 2020, and, and I will post a link to that in the description of the video. There will be um, uh, attributions of the artists in that description. We were in Lada looking at other things like this. <laughs> this is a giant sauropod who marks a location where sauropod footprints have been fossilized. And this is just to show you that there is more to the region of Lada than Seven Noble Knights, although Seven Noble Knights is uh, my favorite part of it. So for now, let's go to Barbadillo with Doña Lambra and the brothers. It's a pretty little town with an enormous church. Barbadillo is not on the public art series route, but it celebrates the legend in its own ways, such as with this hotel restaurant named for Doña Lambra. I got a real kick out of that. And a Lambra Street. That's me on Lambra Street in Barbadillo. And that's right, the citizens of Barbadillo still staunchly support this infamous lady, the big bad lady of the novel. There's even a statue complex that tells most of the story. I had to have my photo with my villainess. The plaque avoids mentioning that she's the antagonist in the story. Behind her, on the left, her husband, Ruy Blasquez, the knight's uncle, glowers across at another important character we'll get to shortly, Mugarra. Behind her head, we have symbols of the pre-Christian religions of Spain, as well as Christianity and Islam. Part of the same complex, this sculpture, shows architectural elements of the 10th century from both the northern and the southern regions, and we'll see why very shortly. The second mural in the series, portraying what happened in Barbadillo, is wrapped around a small building in Quintana Lara. This is the incident in the legend that captured my imagination in order to write the novel in the first place. In order to get to symbolic revenge on her nephews, since a real revenge is no longer possible, Lambra has her servant throw a cucumber engorged with blood at them. It hits Gonzalo, and he becomes so offended and outraged that he murders the servant right at her feet. I tried to write this passage so that the reader can still sympathize with Gonzalo and his brothers. And indeed, the throwing of cucumbers in the Middle Ages has a lot of legal and social subtleties. Um, there's an excerpt of this scene available to read, and I'll include a link to that, as well as a short analysis of what the cucumber could mean. But mostly, it captured my imagination because it's so bizarre. I love the landscapes in this painting. Um, and here we have a very uh, superior kind of look on Doña Lambra, uh, which is appropriate. But um, these guys look a little too casual here, leaning on the electric box. This is a very tense scene, and I think they should be a little more riled up. Mambrillas de Lara is where my friend and I happened upon mural number five, which is a beautifully executed portrayal of one of the next important scenes. The doom-filled auguries read in the flights of birds, just before the vengeance cycle escalates to the point of no return. I had to have my photo with my heroes. They're stopped on the road, pretty sure they want to continue, but their tutor is telling them they must turn back. 
they all head off to Alminar, in what is today the province of Soria, lured by the promise of a rich land ready for the taking. Now I'd like to read some fragments from chapter 9. Young Gonzalo sat astride his mount on the valley crest, with his brothers, his tutor, his uncle, and both companies of troops behind him. The valley of Alminar opened out green beneath them, fragrant as the morning sunlight warmed the dewy grasses. A hundred head of cattle grazed lazily, surrounded by droves of bleating sheep, their shepherd perhaps resting hidden among the brush. Young Gonzalo heard the animals' calls beckoning to him. It's everything our uncle promised, a jackrabbit bounded between his horse's legs. This is one of the most challenging passages I have ever written. Not only did I have to research plausible details for the biggest and most pivotal battle in the book, but I had to put the reader in the valley fighting alongside Gonzalo and his brothers. I needed the reader to feel the emotional equivalent of the sweat and blood the seven noble knights had to wade through. If this chapter wasn't convincing and memorable, the rest of the epic story would be hardly worth reading. And I had to accomplish all this with no knowledge of the location. All I had back then was Google Maps and the features the medieval source texts required of the terrain. And now that I live in Spain and have a trusty friend to take me to out-of-the-way medieval places, I can show you photos of the valley where the seven brothers fought for their lives. As we left the province of Burgos, I imagined marching with my characters toward the fertile fields of Soria to take cattle and whatever loot they could find. I'm happy to report that Soria today matches the description in Chapter 9. It's resplendent with rolling farmlands and wild areas. When we came up on Alminar, the site of the battle, the valley opened out below us even bigger than I'd imagined. Over 1,000 years, the undulations of the land have surely changed, so I'm not too bothered that I couldn't grasp exactly where every important monument would have taken place. Here's another excerpt. The opposite crest was swimming in the red, blue, white, black, yellow, and green banners of Moorish soldiers as they appeared to rise out of the ground, sending the cattle lowing in every direction. The fluttering obscured the men beneath the flags and made it difficult to estimate their number. But if their hill was as wide as the one from which he now looked, there could be as many as three hundred. The biggest surprise was the existence of the castle. It should not have been a surprise, since the word Alminar refers to a battlement or a watchtower, but there it was with its own history. I regret that we couldn't find anyone to open the castle up to us, because from there the views of the valley would have been the most impressive. Some sources say that the oldest parts of the castle are contemporary with my characters, the 10th century. This would be parts of the homage tower or the keep, which we couldn't get close enough to inspect. If there was a castle in the 10th century, then the seven noble knights would have seen the Moorish troops coming at them from around it. Most of the castle as seen today was built in the 15th and 16th centuries, and belonged to the Counts of Gomara. Kings Carlos II and Felipe V were in residence at certain times. The castle also inspired some of the legends written by the famous romantic poet Gustavo Adolfo Becker, and it said he lived and wrote here. It looks like a pretty good writer's retreat to me. There was a sign on the door that we could barely make out that said something about the modernist poet Antonio Machado and his young wife, Leonor Izquierdo, staying there as well. This was apparently her hometown. So, lots of history, aside from being a seminal place and seven noble knights. This 20th century stained glass window is in the building on the site of the ancestral home of the seven brothers in Salas de los Infantes, their hometown. It shows this epic battle scene with colors and romantic figures. And while all of this is going on, Ruy Vazquez has sent Don Gonzalo, the knight's father, south into no man's land and to the capital of the Caliphate of Cordoba, with a message for its most powerful man, Almansor. The first place he stops is the monastery of Santo Domingo de Silos, which may ring a bell as the monastery with the singing monks. This is what it looks like today. At the time of the book, this monastery was just being built, and the saint for whom it is now named wouldn't be born for another hundred 
years or so. But throughout the Middle Ages, monasteries served as shelters for travelers, and this is the last place Don Gonzalo feels remotely comfortable on his journey. His trip lasts about two weeks and starts with the no-man's land on the plains of present-day Madrid and La Mancha. I've decided to represent this very lonely part of the journey with an Osborne bull. These were sherry advertisements which were spared from demolition when alcohol ads were removed from the roadways because of their ever so Spanish shape. They are 46 feet high and there are 90 of them throughout Spain. They always look a bit lonely to me because there are no other billboards. And the planes spread out all around them. Don Gonzalo, of course, would not have seen any Osborne bulls. In fact, the only things he does see in this area are some Moorish frontier guards who had a good long laugh at him. What else would he have seen as he moved on? Here we have Toledo, dramatically positioned at a nearly circular bend in the Tagus River. It was the capital of the Visigothic Kingdom of Spain before the arrival of the Moors, and it remained an important city throughout the Middle Ages. It would have been fascinating for Don Gonzalo to stop in Toledo, but in order to keep the book moving along, he merely thinks about how he would like to win it back for the King of Leon, and continues. I think these plains may have had a bit more vegetation at the time of Don Gonzalo's journey, but they're still vast, they still take a very long time to cross, and he gets a terrible sunburn. Driving through La Mancha today, you might feel transported to the Renaissance, the time of Don Quixote. This photo was taken in 2009 in a place called Consuegra. It's um, been very reformed, updated, and uh, tourism friendly <laughs> now. Here it's kind of wild. Depends what you prefer. As you continue south into Andalusia, the landscape becomes hillier. This scene, with its whitewashed village between olive-covered hillsides, probably didn't look much different in the 10th century. There are a few modern additions, and the church tower would have been a minaret. Don Gonzalo survives largely on the charity of strangers. He accepts food, but he sleeps in the rough because he can't communicate very well with anyone. All of a sudden, the landscape turns mountainous. What was a grueling journey now becomes a complex upward and downward haul heartache and sorrows until he finally makes it to the capital city of Cordoba. This is a panorama I've pasted together out of two photos as you can tell and they call this the Roman Bridge. If Don Gonzalo saw this bridge he would also have seen this tower or its predecessor. Not many historic bridges today have kept their medieval customs towers so I really appreciate having this one here to suggest the medieval ambiance. In the back here we have the monumental, unique Mesquita Catedral. It is now only a cathedral, but it maintains so many of the characteristics of the Grand Mosque, built over more than 300 years during Muslim rule, that the people can't help but still call it La Mesquita. In any case, this is not the view Gonzalo would have happened upon. He walked up to the city wall, and after observing some rotting heads of Cordoba's enemies over the gate, he decides to venture inside, because he's not an enemy after all. And this is what he sees when he gets inside. I think this is a good place to end part two. Tune in again for part three. And if you have any questions for me, feel free to leave them in the comments here or direct message me on any social media platform. Thanks for watching.